and welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we attack our most pervasive fears with truth. Because life is too short for any of us to live enslaved. We are passionate about helping God's children live in freedom. We would love to chat with you online or on social media. Visit our show notes to learn how to connect with us. I'm Jennifer Slattery. And I'm Jody Bailey. And today we want to talk about those times when life hits hard, hard enough to knock us on our knees and incapacitate us for a time when we've lost something really valuable and when our heart feels irreparably broken. And in those seasons, we might be tempted to shove our feelings down, to distract ourselves, to numb ourselves with destructive coping mechanisms. We might lash out at God and at others. And the problem with each of those responses is that they often leave us stuck. They can leave us stuck and they might even compound our pain, leading to bitterness, resentment, and disillusionment with God and life. You know, when I was in college, we went through, in my family, we call it the Job season because it just felt like it was one thing after another. And it began, uh, my Aunt Shirley, <clears throat> she was a mother figure to me and she found out that her, she had cancer and it had come back. And almost immediately after that, um, one of my dad's on Thanksgiving Day, one of my dad's best friends passed away suddenly. Christmas Eve, my uh, other uncle, my uncle passed away on Christmas Eve from cancer. And we were losing my Aunt Shirley. And in, in the midst of that, between Christmas Eve and my Aunt Shirley passed away in June, my grandmother had emergency five-way bypass. And so here, here's Aunt Shirley trying to care for her. <laughs> and, and all these things are happening. But I remember on, on Christmas night, and my, my uncle had died, and I knew we were, at this point, I just kind of knew we were going to lose lose Shirley. And it was so much. I came home, and I just, I ripped the Christmas tree down. I was in college. I, was in my, I had a Christmas tree in my in my little dorm apartment, and nobody else was there. And I just tore that tree down and threw it across the room, and I was so upset, and I was so angry. And so hopeless. And I went, uh, I was engaged at the time. About three days later, I just, in this fit of, I guess it was a fit of everybody leaves me or I'm going to lose everybody. I don't know. But I went and I broke off my engagement uh, with my fortunately, blessedly, now husband. He would not let me. He kind of gave me a couple weeks to cool off. And then he kind of gradually made his way back and started calling. He, he kept pursuing me. He wouldn't let me walk away. I think he saw that, uh, that grieving me was not real me. Uh, and he, 26, five years later, <laughs> it, it seemed to be something God worked in big time. Wow. You know, it can be, I think, I like what you said, grieving me was not the real me. And I think we need to kind of recognize that both in ourselves and when others are grieving, giving that space to say, you know what, this person is responding from pain. And I think it's really confusing to grieve well. And I think that's maybe why millions of believers throughout the centuries have found such comfort in the book of Job. So it's a section of scripture that honestly and transparently deals with suffering. And it begins with an introduction to a godly, generous, and well-respected man. His name is Job and, and his wife who experienced more heartache then most of us will in a lifetime, 10 times over, unless you're Jody Bailey, and then you might experience it in one holiday season. But by the end of chapter one, he's lost his kids. He's lost his extensive wealth. And then before he can, so it's just like boom, 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 one tragedy after another hit. And before he can really process all that's occurred, he receives painful boils that cover him from his head to his feet. So that, I mean, he had to be just emotionally, mentally, and physically exhausted, done, overwhelmed. And while this isn't a story, the whole book of Job isn't a story about his wife, we do catch a glimpse of her in it. And obviously, all of his suffering affected her as well. Okay, you know, I think we give Job's wife a bad rap because we only really see her for about six or seven words in the Bible, and she's playing into exactly what Satan wanted. Uh, she, it says in, in verse 9 of Job 2, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. To which he replies, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? 
And in all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. So we tend to judge her on this, this lashing out and this, this one sentence that she says, and we forget that she's grieving as well. The, the focus is so heavily on Job. We forget she's lost her children. She's lost all of her wealth, all of her security, and she's looking at a husband who is suffering so intensely that the Bible tells us he's sitting in an ash heap, scraping himself with broken plates, essentially, trying to find some relief. Anger is a God-given emotion, and we forget that. We, we see sometimes the results, the destructive results of our anger, and so then we tend to think all anger is bad. But God did give us our emotions, and it wasn't so much that, first of all, I understand, I think I would have been, oh my goodness, I can't imagine if I had been Job's wife. I would have been saying a lot more than six words. <laughs> <laughs> And I would have been angry and depressed for a really long time. I don't know, honestly, I don't know if that's something I would have gotten over to lose your children. I really don't know. I mean, that's such a, so for those who've lost their children, that's such a hard, hard thing to process. And you will be angry, like anger is a normal part of grief. And the problem is we often misplace it. And when we misplace it, we don't receive the healing and the comfort because it's it's misplaced. And, and it's, and I think it's often too quickly expressed. And I think you're right. Like I can think of another time I got my, my default. And I think for a lot of us is when something bad happens, I skip denial and go straight to anger. And I remember when my, when my grandmother passed away, um, I am not a person who uses a lot of four letter words, but for about two weeks after she died that I was, I was pretty vocal in a lot of things I said, um, and how I said them and the words I used. Um, and I had a very wise friend who said, you know, you're angry because she died suddenly and she was my best friend. And I lost, lost, you know, that person I talked to every day. And, and so this wise person said to me, you're very angry and that's your anger expressing itself. Let it express itself, get it out, but don't get stuck there and live there forever. And so it lasted about two weeks. And then I was able to process the rest of the grief but I think because anger is a negative emotion, we tend to not express it and not let ourselves feel it. And we, it harms us in the end because we end up stuffing it inside, which only anger is one of those things that if you stuff it and you don't deal with it, it just gets hotter. So a book that I would recommend anyone who's dealing with really any kind of deep, painful emotions. It's Cry of the Soul by Dr. Allender. And I don't remember the name of the other author, but we'll put it in the show notes. And a couple of things he says, and when I say like when anger is too too quickly expressed, he talks about, what I mean by that, he talks about wrestling with our anger where we sit and we kind of analyze it. And like, what am I, what am I angry? What am I really angry about? And then bringing God into this, what am I, what does this say about my relationship with God or what's going on between God and I? And I'm going to give a couple of quotes that he says that I, I really liked. So he said, unrighteous anger is a dark energy that demands for the self a more tolerable world now, instead of waiting for God's redemption, according to divine design and timing. Now he does, he does mention how anger serves a purpose and that it draws out our deepest questions and doubts. But then he, he goes on to say, righteous anger is a hatred of sin. And then I would add of all of sin's effects, right? And, and then he says, and a love of beauty. So when we're angry at death, and like with Job's wife, she had a right to be angry. And I think God is angry too when he looks at the way our world sometimes plays out. And I think he feels, I, I know he feels angry when a child is abused or dies or, so it's, it's but what are we angry at? We're angry that we live in a broken world where death occurs and we're anxious. We know it's wrong. We know it's not right. It's not what we are created for. And we're anxious for heaven. And so Dr. Allender, he says, God invites us to pour out our anger before him so that our anger might be eventually turned against the one who most deserves it, the evil one. And that's awesome because especially in Job's story, you see the evil one prominently in Job's story. And it's important to realize the evil one calls the things that happened to Job, not God, 
uh, God allowed it, Job caused it. And I think there's some confusion there sometimes. But I think also um, anger sometimes is born out of fear. And I believe that Job's wife, she had a lot to fear. She was, she had lost her children. She had lost her security of the wealth. Job was a wealthy, wealthy man. She's facing losing her husband and that's going to leave her with nothing. And in the, in the time at this, that was a really bad place. It's it's always a bad place to be, but at the time she lived, that was an incredibly uh, frightening place to be. And so her lashing out, I think, you know, we can't really fault her so much as, as we do without really looking at the whole of what else we know about her, which is very little. But she did stick around with Job until the end. Um, and I think that says a lot about her character that we overlook. Mm-hmm. Well, and one thing I find really interesting that I have to remind myself in the whole, like if you read the entire book of Job, God never answers some of those big questions like, why did Job suffer? He never, he never gives that answer. And, and I'm reminded that not all suffering has an answer. And I think it's also scripture called Job a righteous man, and yet he still suffered. And I think that's important for us to remember that suffering isn't always the result of personal sin. It's the result of living in a sin tarnished world. And I think that's where one of the things, you know, Jesus wept at Lazarus's tomb. Uh, if you go into Luke, I believe. But I think part of it was he was weeping for the grief of the people around him, but also for the fact that death even had to exist because it's not what he created. It was not his will for the world and sin brought it in. And sometimes we suffer uh, and, and there's things we will never understand. I mean, with with Job's wife in particular, the death of children, you know, I mean, her children were grown, but, you know, how do we ever grasp that? I had a friend, so she called herself a rabid reader, and she read, this was before I got published, and she read everything I'd ever written. And That's she, awesome. Yes, she was amazing. And she got brain cancer, and I was so convinced God was going to heal her. And when he didn't, I went through a period where I was so angry, I couldn't pray. And actually, I was angry. This will sound probably terrible, but I was angry that God brought us together as friends, knowing that she was going to die. And I went through this period where it just felt so dark and heavy because I was grieving without God. And the grief was so much to bear on my own. I didn't have the strength to bear it. And I finally realized, and I was really, I was in my kitchen and I'm like, you know what? I don't like that you allowed this. I don't understand why you allowed this. I'm really angry that this happened, but I'm going to choose to follow you. It just, that heaviness, I still grieved, but I grieved for a long time, but that heaviness of the grief lifted because I was no longer carrying it alone. Yes. And I think we do get angry with God in our grief because I went through the same thing with my aunt Shirley. And I remember the day I was on my knees on my bed two years later, screaming at God at how angry I was. And we have to tell him that. That's the key thing. We put up a wall between him and us when we don't tell him. The healing begins when we get real with him and we say, you know what? I am angry with you. And then he can say, okay, now I can work with this. It's when we're fighting him that that we make that disconnect with him. And we don't, like you said, grieve with him. And he's big enough to handle it. He's big enough to hold us through it. And this is a really heavy conversation. And so if you are grieving, first of all, just say, give yourself permission to feel like Jody said, just let it out, feel it and maybe get some help, maybe seek a counselor. And if you have somebody in your life who is, is grieving, let them feel it. Don't let their anger and their grief freak you out because God, when my friend was dying, she, oh my goodness, she was mad. And so many people told me, well, she shouldn't do that. She shouldn't, whatever. I'm like, God brought her, you know, God brought her to a place of where she went in peace in the end. But so let our friends grieve, let ourselves grieve. And I just thank you for listening. I hope our conversation deepened your understanding of God, the God who is big enough to handle all of your emotions. And I hope that gives you courage just to feel with him, to be authentic with him, like Jody talked about. If you haven't already done so, we encourage you to subscribe to this podcast and then you won't miss a single episode and make sure to share it on social media. We would be super, super encouraged if you would rate it as well. That helps others to find it. 
And until next time, may you live with the courage of one who truly has been set free. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to Faith Over Fear, a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. If you enjoyed what you heard today, we'd love for you to head over to your favorite podcast app and leave us a review. To learn more about Jennifer Slattery or to check out any of the resources she mentioned in this episode, just head over to her website, jenniferslatterylivesoutloud.com, or check out our show notes. This episode was produced by Kelly Givens and edited by Stephen Sanders. A special thanks to our executive producer, Stephen McGarvey. For more Faith Toolkit podcasts like this, just head over to lifeaudio.com.